That totally works. All right, cool. Let's do it. Woohoo! Yay! Okay, super duper. So let's start with a short attunement, and then we'll just glide right into where we left off, okay? Let's do it. Okay, so let's just have the spine nice and straight. Close the eyes and draw the awareness inward. Inhale deeply. And as you exhale, release all the interactions of the day, no matter how wonderful or how challenging. Let's just let it all go with the breath for now. And breathe in the sweet peace of this moment. Anything that's not serving you to hold on to, breathing in a deeper and deeper sense of well-being here and now, and not postponing our well-being for any future conditions or eventualities, but claiming it with this very breath. We will begin with the sound of OM together three times. So would you please lead us in the OM? Absolutely. Thank so you. take a deep breath in. So uh, the answer to um, the two types of vrittis can be thought of as pain, uh, uh, self-fish and self-liss is because the self-fish vrittis are just like the painful vrittis because when all we right. care about is ourselves and we lose sight of other people. We lose sight of our connection with them and by losing that sight, we end up damaging our intelligence, which is our ability to get along with everyone and everything. And by damaging that, we cease to get along peacefully. And by ceasing to get along peacefully, we're stuck in stress, discomfort, and disease. Right. So the two vrittis are painful and painless, and they correspond to selfish and selfless. Because when we do selfish action, ultimately that ends up in pain. And when we do selfless action, ultimately that is painless because we don't have attachment to the outcome, which is what makes it selfless. And because we don't have attachment to the outcome and it's a selfless act, there's no way we can feel pain about it. Yeah. Whereas if it's selfish and we're attached to the outcome and we don't get what we want, then we could feel pain. Mm, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So I'm just elaborating on the answer that you gave, which was very correct. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's like right knowledge um, is seeing a snake, and it is a snake. The next one is misconception, that's seeing a rope and taking it as a snake. Then there's verbal delusion, which is um, like political campaigners, like verbal delusion <laughs> is um, <laughs> Obama saying he's going to close Guantanamo Bay and four pa years pass and he still hasn't closed Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> so that's verbal delusion, you know, saying one thing but not really acting upon it. And then there's memory, which is recalling things from the past. And then there's sleep, which is cognitive cognition of nothingness. So those are the five types of mental modifications. And if you look at any thought you're having, it could fit into one of those categories. What are the special qualities of the mantra OM 
according to Sri Patanjali, as beneficial to repeat as an object of meditation. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, Patanjali says that Om is the first and universal name for God. It is the name for Ishvara, and it sort of is what becomes uh, differentiated into the gunas and uh, similarly, proceedingly, into everything else. So the benefits of chanting Om are, first and foremost, connecting with Source, connecting with our divine creator, tuning in to that higher frequency, which is the divine frequency. And that gives us the additional benefits of elevating our minds, calming us, bringing us to a state of peace, and also to a state of alertness and tranquility. Okay, that's good. Yes, Om is the sound of the cosmic vibration of the universal heart. Sri Patanjali said that Om is the name and form of God. And so when we repeat that sound, frequency, vibration, we attune ourselves, as you said, to the frequency of the divine. And in so doing, we feel wholeness, oneness, union, connection. We feel tranquil, peaceful. Um, and yeah, it glides us into samadhi, union with the divine, through repeating the mantra whole. Mm. It means by stira and sukham, when we're doing the asanas, for example, stira is stability, strength, um, and sukham is ease, relaxed, happy. So we want to have a combination of both strength and ease, of effort and relaxation. It's like the yin and yang in each posture that you want to use right effort to make a steady pose that's correctly aligned, but then you want to breathe into it and relax and be comfortable and tune into the peace of your own true nature in it. So when practicing asana, Patanjali is talking about that balance between steadiness, strength, and relaxation, ease, and flow. That's in the asana practice. Then also off the mat, how do we find the balance between strength and flow in our lives? So maybe strength is taking a stand for something you believe in, but then flow would be knowing when not to push the point and when to let go and move on. And so it's that balance in everyday life of when to assert your strength and when to let go and, and flow, both on and off the mat. Mm. Well, thank you. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, I was teaching the um, yoga diet at Alawa's retreat, and there was one person, sometimes people who are can come just for the day who aren't part of the teacher's training. And this one person who came uh, just for the day, and I was going over all the reasons to choose a compassionate vegan diet. And so I was giving all these statistics about how it affects the water supply, starvation, topsoil, greenhouse effect, pollution, economy, animal rights, domestic violence, war, da 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 And I was giving in each one of these ca um, categories these very potent bullet points of statistics of how the meat, dairy, egg industry has a devastating effect on all these areas that I just mentioned. So as we're going along, everyone's really gaining all this reasons of why they should choose a compassionate vegan diet. And one person um, got up and said, um, you know, this is really disturbing me, this person who came just for the day because he didn't really know the whole context of yoga or anything and he wasn't a vegetarian. And he stood up and said, you know, this is really bothering me on a really deep 
level. And he said, um, in fact, reading all this makes me want to eat meat even more. Really? Why? And yeah, so that was the question, like, why? And um, so here we're going to talk about uh, these two points, uh, Stira and Sukhom. So Stira is me as the facilitator um, taking a stand for the truth I'm sharing, but also not reacting and showing unconditional love and ease toward him. Because you see, if I had reacted, um, that would have been, uh, can you hold on here just for one moment? Please? Sure, sure. We're talking about these two principles on and off the mat. So I was taking a stand for being in my truth, but then the sukham, I was not rigid about that. I still showed him unconditional love, and I tried to listen to his point of view with respect. Not that I agreed with it, but I held the space of love rather than reaction. And so then what happened was this particular person had injured his ankle previous to coming. And so then after that, we did our Hatha Yoga portion. And I held him up as an example to the group. I said, now here, this individual, he is focusing on what he can do rather than what he cannot do. And that's a great example for all of us, both as yoga students and as yoga teachers. He didn't say, oh, I injured my ankle, so I'm not going to do Hatha Yoga. He is doing whatever portion of it he can do without aggravating his ankle, but focusing on what he can do. And then during the deep relaxation, I said, the body tends to cool off during the deep relaxation. Would anyone like a towel or blanket? And he said he would. And I brought over a beach towel I had, and I covered him lovingly and tucked him in so he would be warm during the deep relaxation. Now, because I held the space of unconditional love for him, even though I very much disagreed with his point of view, that was the most transformative energy. If I had combated him and say, how dare you say that makes you want to eat more after I've compiled all these statistics proving to you that it has a devastating effect on all the ecosystems on the planet, how could you possibly want to eat more, meat more <laughs> instead of less? If I had been combative, I would have caused a reaction and negativity. But by holding the space of unconditional love, he was actually transformed. And then by the end of the day, because he was there for the whole day, in our closing circle, he said how much he appreciated the love that was shown to him from everyone in the group and how instead of suffering alone with his injured ankle, he was able to be part of this group today. And so... This is how you balance those things between taking a stand for the truth and for going with the flow and being easeful and being relaxed and being loving. Both are necessary. We, we need structure and flow. And this is... This principle that Patanjali is talking about applies both in our asana practice that if you are push too much, you injure yourself. If you don't push enough, you don't make progress. So it's how to find that balance between steadiness and happiness, structure and flow, yin and yang, assertion and surrender. Can you see how both are necessary, like the in and out breath? Absolutely. Okay, great. So now we can move on. How can practicing the teachings of Sri Patanjali help an individual attain his, her personal goals? Wow. I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a loaded one because it seems so obvious. I mean, the whole point of what Sri Patanjali is talking about is to help someone attain his or her personal goals. But then at the same time, it's also to <laughs> transform one's own personal goals for one's public or dharmic goals, right? To realize one's sort of higher nature and to abide by that. 
Um, so someone might enter into uh, Patanjali's work thinking to themselves, oh, how do I increase my vitality? And then by increasing their vitality, their whole value systems change. So um, it's kind of a catch-22. So his system might increase your personal goals or help you attain them by essentially clarifying them and changing them to things that are more sattvic as opposed to rajasic, which is something that a personal goal may be in its nature. Yes, all that you said is completely true. And I would just add to that through the eight limbs of Raja Yoga, and you could go through each one of the yamas and yamas, how by observing that or restraining from that would it help you to attain your personal goals? And then asana, going through, well, if you do asanas, you have a healthier body. And if you have a healthier body, then you have the health to attain your goals. Then the next one after asana is pranayama, the one you did say, vitality. If you do pranayama and you strengthen your vital body, you have more vitality, perseverance to attain your goals. Then the next one after asana, pranayama, pratyahara, well, if you draw your awareness inward, then you can listen to your inner guidance, which would help you to know which doors to knock on. So you're not just knocking on doors that won't open for you and wasting your time. And then dharana. Well, if you develop your power of concentration, that helps you to concentrate on realizing your goals rather than getting dissipated. Then dhyana, meditation. Well, when you're in a state of meditation, you're connected with the source of all creation. So, of course, you could, uh, when you're connected with the one, realize your highest goals, including your spiritual goals. And then samadhi, when you're in union with the divine. And then from that place, divinely guided right action just naturally flows from you. And so all your goals would not only benefit you, but the entire universe. Yeah, <laughs> that was a beautiful answer. Thank you so much. What is Vedanta and or Advaita? Non-duality and oneness of life. So that's Vedanta or Advaita is non-dualism. And what that is about is... Normally, we think of ourselves as separate from God, and that's the myth of separation. And in non-duality, we claim our oneness with the divine. I had this experience once with Swami Satyananda, and this might be a great thing to post on your blog. <laughs> and I was uh, organizing the satsang, which are the spiritual gatherings with um, Swamiji on, <clears throat> in Santa Barbara. <clears throat> I did that for many years. And so this one particular satsang, it was around the time of Valentine's Day. And the format was that people asked questions. They wrote them down on index cards. And then we would collect the cards and put them in a box next to the seat. And he would open the satsang by giving some opening remarks, and then he would go to the questions, and his satsang would be constituted of the answers to these questions. So my question was, <clears throat> will I be united like Valentine in this lifetime? And if so, how can I expedite the process? And so on did his hmm with the pregnant pause. Whenever he did that, you knew it was going to be a really profound answer. Mm. Scans the audience with his eyes. And then he said, you are already united with God, and there is nothing but that. And when he said it, I had my receptor sites open and I got it. And then I 
felt enlightened in that moment, and it was just like amazing. And then that feeling of non-dualism lasted for about two or three weeks, and then it kind of wore off like a drug, unfortunately, um, hmm. where I started, you know, falling back into the false identification with being the mind and the body. And then, but I was permanently changed by the remembrance of that because I can still go back to the remembrance of that and I can still glide into that state of consciousness, the non-dual consciousness, which is where you and the divine are one. It's kind of like the drops in the ocean. The drops may think they're separate identities, but they're really no different than the substance of the ocean itself. Yeah, that. Uh, so uh, the difference between Brahman and Atman is um, Atman is supposed to represent our individualized, personalized soul. And our personalized soul is not detached from Brahman. Brahman is the absolute reality, the overarching right. reality over everything. So Atman right. is connected directly to that. But it's our own individualized, personalized aspect of that greater creation where it's not separate from it and it's not our ego. It's not even further differentiated into ego, but it is like the pure soul of who we are. Um, uh, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's our drop in the ocean before we recognize <laughs> ourselves just as a little drop. Right. That's right. So the Atman is the immortal self or Atman that's in each one of us. And that's kind of like a little piece of Brahman broken off into each of us when we're in a non when we're in the realm of dualism. But in non dualism we recognize that we are not different than our source. We become one. So that's when the individual soul you could say connects with the cosmic soul and then the result is union or oneness with mm. the divine. That's beautiful. Okay, let's move on. Next, what is man? So the self with a capital S represents the big self. That's the Atman. This is our pure conscious state that's just a piece of Brahman. And the self with the lowercase s, that's our ego. That's our little self. That's the self that lives in an illusion who we think ourselves to be, but who is not that, who is something greater than that, which is the greater self of Atman. Right. The big self would be your true self, which is um, peace, pure consciousness, love. And the small self, as you said, would be the ego, which means false identification with being the mind or the body, rather than identifying with being the immortal self or Atma. Yeah, beautiful. Or the witness of the mind and body, or the one who is aware of the mind and body. If you think that you're aware of the mind and body, but you're not the mind and body, that is your capital S. If you think you are the mind and body, that's the small s. And the way you can tell the difference is the small s, anything that is composed, decomposes, whereas the big s is eternal, pure, unchanging, uh, immortal, impermanent. So if it's permanent, excuse me, meaning permanent. So if it's the small self, it's impermanent. If it's the big self, it's eternal. Mm. The big S. Yeah. Okay. Two methods that the Yana Yogi uses and brief. So two methods that the Yana Yogi uses is one, um, neti neti. Right, so this is Ramana Maharshi's method of asking himself and uh, 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 asking other people, or promoting the idea really for other people to ask themselves the same question, who am I? And then answering truthfully, well, I am not this, 
I'm not my hands, I'm not my head, I'm not my eyes, I'm not blah, 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 until we realize who we truly are. So that's one, the neti neti method. Um, another method for the jnana yogi is, um, is through study, um, uh, svadaya, right? A scriptural study to understand the truth passed down through the ages, or even just contemplative samyama, uh, meditation, a contemplation on the subject. And that's okay. that's the yeah. What what do you have to add to that? <clears throat> yeah, definitely the neti neti. Uh, I'm not this. You know, I'm not a mother. I'm not a sister. I'm not a daughter. I'm not because all those things are impermanent. And then when you just keep through trial, uh, through um, process of elimination, you get to who you truly are, which is pure consciousness. So <clears throat> the one who is aware of who is asking that question, the one who is aware of the phenomena, but not the phenomena itself, pure consciousness, Purusha. Um, the other method is just, you know, not the neti neti, I'm not this, I'm not that, but the other thing would be just to meditate on who am I? Who am I? When you meditate on that question, who am I, it kind of boggles the mind. <laughs> the mind can't really come up to an answer with that. And so the mind for a moment can go still. And in that stillness, we can experience the peace of our own true nature, the peace which passes all understanding. It says in the Bible, <clears throat> be still and know that I am God. So by meditating on the question, who am I, we can bring the mind to a stillness where we can have the direct experience of who we are, which is peace. Mm. Beautiful. And I think that the yani, yana yogi could also, any kind of self-analysis, any self-inquiry, as you said, swadaya, certainly that could help. Anything having to do with an intellectual approach to accessing the divine. A mental approach. Okay. <clears throat> Next. Um, what is Swami Satchidananda's definition of a selfless act? Um, so... Uh, a definition of a selfless act would be any act born out of res for respect first and foremost for um, uh, the, benefic the beneficence towards another person. Um, so without regard to any sort of personal gain or personal interest, um, so purely from love or compassion. Yes, that's true. And he also, <clears throat> that is true and correct. He also says that a selfless act, um, well, that's his definition of a perfect act, is something that brings benefit to someone and harm to no one. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, so I think that a selfless act and a perfect act, um, yeah, brings benefit to someone and harm to no one. Okay. It is emphasized by yana yoga, which we just discussed. Then what is emphasized by bhakti yoga? Um, what, the heart. Yes. That's correct. Bhakti yoga is the path of devotion. It's the path of people who have an emotional nature, more of a feeling nature. And what are some of the practices of bhakti yoga? Um, kirtan, uh, even seva, uh, even though that's more karma yoga. Um, uh, any Anything that's devotional, anything that um, is love. Uh, so um, chanting God's name, meditation on God, focusing on love, 
um, getting together and singing and chanting and dancing and just feeling good. Yeah, and also that's all true and correct. And then also puja is an act uh, yeah. of bhakti. Okay, where you treat God as the guest, and then in these pujas you offer God, you know, all these sumptuous things and rose petals and, <laughs> you know, the, the elaborate pujas they do. Okay, next. It used to go like that, and the ashram doctor said, no, it should be if you don't starve a cold, you'll have to feed a fever. In other words, if you nip the cold in the bud and you won't get the influenza and the fever. And one way that you can nip it in the bud, a cold, is if the eight pints of blood, instead of going into digestion, is going into healing you, you'll heal a lot faster. So if when you had a cold, instead of eating and your energy having to go into digestion, if instead you were fasting, and by fasting we have to define that too, what that means, because Fasting could be just water, or it could be a liquid diet. Um, I I personally think of fasting as water, and if it's juice, I think of that as a liquid diet, or if it's broth or a blended soup or something like that. I think of that more as a liquid diet than fasting. But fasting, I think of, is water or nothing, just breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, like you do on Yom Kippur, you're not drinking water, you're fasting just on air, right? Yeah. But I would change that to vegetable juice, which I think is much better to fast on because then you don't get the big blast of sugar, but you get more minerals and vitamins. So there, if it says fruit juice, I would put fruit or vegetable juice, preferably vegetable juice from my personal experience. Candida and everything, if they fast on fruit juice, they're just like feeding candida and making it worse. Whereas if they fasted on vegetable juice, uh, it would be better for their system. Okay, next. The purpose of fasting is to experience good health. When you sit to meditate, you won't have any physical distraction. Fasting is a wonderful opportunity to take care of the body. During the first days of a fast, the tongue may become coated, the breath foul. All this is coming from within. It's a good sign. It means everything is being thrown out. You might also experience headaches and nausea. To help to eliminate toxins more quickly, drink plenty of water, take showers, and do deep breathing. As the fast continues, you will experience a lightness in the body and mind. You will begin to get some good signs, tongue clear, saliva sweet. You can prepare to stop the fast. Breaking the fast is even more important than the fast itself. Break it with something very light. If you were just fasting with water, take a little fruit juice. Or if you fasted on fruit juice, try some vegetable broth. Then you can add some well-steamed vegetables. Fasting is also useful at the first sign of a cold or virus infection. So that would answer our question right there. It allows your body to put its energy into healing itself where it would normally be taken up by digestion, which is exactly what I said. And then it says, even if you don't have time for a long fast, fasting one day a week will certainly help you. So according to this, I would say who are really toxic, like let's say people who have been eating meat and fish and eggs and dairy and drugs and cigarettes and alcohol, and their bodies are so filled with toxins. For those people, you would not want them to cleanse it out, the impurities, as quickly as possible because it might be too radical, too extreme, too uncomfortable. For those people, I would suggest doing a more gradual cleansing and so that they wouldn't get what's called a cleansing reaction. Um, and it's also very important to take enemas while you are doing um, a cleanse or fast, because otherwise you can have auto intoxication where you're just recirculating the toxins that were released if you don't eliminate them from, from your system. Because normally when you eat food, that causes peristaltic movement to push out the food that's already in there. But when you're not eating food that triggers that peristaltic reaction, 
then you need to take an enema or some kind of, um, you know, detox tea or some kind of cleanse smart or something like that to help you eliminate while you're doing the cleanse. Otherwise, you could just keep recirculating the toxins. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Okay. So um, a lot could be said about uh, diet, nutrition, lifestyle, and fasting, but um, I think for now we can move on. Okay, so yoga diet is um, first and foremost about ahimsa, doing no harm. And this is doing no harm both to ourselves and to others and to our planet. And a vegan diet um, is, uh, is um, I think, clearly one of the most ahimsic diets possible. We're not doing ourselves harm because we're not bringing in toxic food. Of course, you can be a vegan and eat unhealthy vegan food. There are potato chip vegans out there. They exist, and that's not a good path regardless. But the thing is, is that granted you're not a potato chip vegan and you're eating healthily, right, then eating a vegan diet will provide you with the least toxic foods. Furthermore, you're not hurting your fellow man because having a vegan diet also reduces global greenhouse emissions, reduces um, uh, making our water systems and our earth more toxic and keeps things a lot of more pure, open, and congenial. Um, and then lastly, you're not hurting any other living creature because you don't have to be really slaughtering an animal uh, in order to eat its meat, which is just disgusting. <laughs> and not something most people do regardless. And then to answer about the gunas, so um, a yogic diet uh, should be free of uh, tamasic food, right? So that's food that's clearly uh, poisonous. I mean, this can be drugs, it can, uh, it can be just, you know, those potato chips, right? You can be a vegan, which is a sattvic diet, but also eat very tamasic foods like potato chips or just straight carbs all day long, which isn't healthy for you. Or rajasic, right? So having too much coffee. Um, in, uh, in Ayurveda, they talk about uh, eating garlic or uh, onions or tomatoes, which can be a little bit too stimulating or uh, passionate. Um, and then uh, finally, you want to be sattvic in your diet. So this is a pure diet. So a diet that really assists your health, that helps you live better as opposed to uh, living to eat and eat and eat more, in which case that's really all you can end up doing at the end of the day if you end up falling ill with a disease because of that nasty habit. So it's eating to sustain our health, eating to sustain our bodies and our spirits so that we can perform our dharma. And that's yeah. uh, what I got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. And I'll just enhance upon what you said. So describe the yoga diet in terms of the gunas. The three gunas are rajasic, tamasic, and sattvic. Tamasic food could be food that's old or lacking in chi, vital life force energy, like um, when you have um, overcooked food or leftovers that are lacking in prana tamasic effect on the body, meaning a, a lethargic effect. Um, and then, as you said, the rajasic foods like coffee or anything that makes you hyperactive, wiry, that, um, you know, has like the sugar blues that takes you up and then it drops you down to the tamasic. Whereas when we choose sattvic foods, which is the balanced, neutral, tranquil, balanced state, which are whole foods in moderation, including fruits, vegetables, grains, seeds, nuts, and legumes. When you eat those in moderation, mindfully with the right attitude and gratitude, uh, they glide you into the sattvic state. And how does this relate to Sri Patanjali's teachings of restraint of the modifications with the mind stuff of yoga? How it relates to that is because when you're in the sattvic, neutral, balanced, tranquil state, it's easier to control your mind because you're not at the effect of being tamasic, meaning lethargic, or rajasic, meaning hyperactive. 
And it says in the Yoga Sutras that you can only enter samadhi through the sattvic guna. So when it says restraint of the modifications of the mind step is yoga, what that means is by controlling the mind, you experience union with the divine or union with your own inner peace. And it's easier to control your mind when it's in a tranquil, neutral, balanced, peaceful state than when you're in a hyperactive or lethargic state. Mm. Yeah, 